Dr. Hillgarth is a biologist who served as the executive director of the Birch Aquarium from 2002 to uh, 2014. Previously, she was uh, executive director of the Tracy Avery in Salt Lake City, the largest bird sanctuary in the country, where she collaborated on conservation efforts for marine birds in the Galapagos Islands, Peru, and Argentina. From 2014 to 2017, Dr. Hillgarth served as president and chief executive officer of the New England Aquarium, where she raised the profile of the aquarium's global conservation and research work by uh, founding the Anderson Cobot Center for Ocean Life, as well as, a, as well as developing a vision for the future of the aquarium and the surrounding Boston waterfront. Dr. Hillgarth received her bachelor's degree in zoology from Oxford University in the UK, as well as a PhD in evolutionary biology. She has conducted research on behavior behavioral ecology and evolution of birds in many parts of the world, including Britain, India, Thailand, the Arctic, South America, and the United States. So without further ado, um, I present to you Dr. Hilgarth. Well, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. And it's a, a really a pleasure to be at the La Jolla Community Center, even though sadly it's virtually at the moment. And it's also a pleasure to be able to talk to you about my very favorite subject, and that's birding. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen. I'm going to really, really try and give you a little bit of a flavor of what it is like to go bird watching in and around San Diego or birding as we tend to say. And I wanna say at the beginning, I'm not an expert birder. I don't know that I'm even a very good birder but I am a highly enthusiastic birder and I have been for the last 50 years or so, first in Europe and then for the last several decades here in Southern California. We are incredibly blessed because we live in probably the biggest biodiversity hotspot in the whole of the United States. It's an extraordinary place to see birds and over 500 species have been seen in San Diego County. So, it's a fabulous place to start what I think is a wonderful hobby or simply enjoy the birds in your backyard. So what do you need to go birding? Well, and why have I shown you a picture of what I realize is a rather dirty pair of binoculars, which is my own. Um, if you need the one piece of equipment you really, really need is a pair of binoculars because most of the time you're going to be quite far away from the birds and you don't want to disturb them too much. And so you want to be able to see them clearly and you want also to have a wide field of vision so you can actually spot the birds. And for identifying and enjoying birds, binoculars are a must. There are lots of really good guides out there on the web. There's, uh, the Audubon Society has an excellent guide to what kind of binoculars to get and what price range, because they can range from $2,000 to $200. And so it can be quite bewildering at first but you really do get what you pay for. And these are a, a low cost, but fairly good workhorse binoculars that cost me $350 some years ago, and they've been all over the world with me. And um, they're a little bit battered now. The thing about binoculars is that the more expensive ones let in more light. And that can be critical when you're looking at a bird in a bush and you are just seeing a dark silhouette if you've got an inexpensive pair of binoculars. If you have really good quality binoculars, you're going to be able to see colors and shapes and patterns as well. So binoculars are a critical piece of equipment. Now, some people get carried away and buy all sorts of wonderful clothes for birding. And yes, it can be very useful to have a vest like this to put maybe your binoculars, your cameras, your notebook, those kind of things. But in fact, the main thing is to be dry and warm and comfortable, or if it's sunny, have a good sun hat. So wear what you normally go hiking in, is what I tell my friends. The other essential piece of equipment is a bird guide. And there are several excellent bird guides out there. I tend to use Sibley. That is my favorite um, bird guide. I have, um, this is the first edition of Sibley, but it's, it's quite a big, 
heavy book to carry around. Some people love uh, Kaufman's Field Guide or the more old-fashioned Peterson's. National Geographic has one. The National Audubon Society has just brought out um, a new one. And there is also Stokes Field Guide to Birds, which some people use. So this is really going to help you know what you're seeing and give you a lot more enjoyment of this kind of hobby. But the good news is that there are now also wonderful apps to identify birds that also are um, easily downloaded to whatever phone you have. And some of them are free. And the Cornell Lab for Ornithology has this wonderful app called Merlin. And it is free. It has most of the birds that you will see in this identification guide, a very easy key to help you uh, know what you've seen. Uh, Audubon Society also has a free guide, which um, I haven't downloaded yet, but I gather it's excellent. And there are also some guides that you can pay for that are companions to the field guide. So the Sibley guide that I use, there's also a Sibley e-guide that you can download to your phone. There's also iBird, which is an excellent app that you can download. Um, it does not have a companion book and National Geographic and Peterson also have apps. So in the field, it can be very handy to, to just carry your phone with you rather than uh, a, a heavy bird book. There's also a, another wonderful app and website, and that is also from the Cornell Lab for Ornithology and it's called eBird. And eBird is really a wonderful way to not only find out what birds are in your area, especially at what times of year, but also to contribute to citizen science by uploading the birds that you have seen. So if you go to your local park and you see um, say 20 species of birds, you can upload that day of birding to eBird and that helps everybody else know what is around. But what I use eBird for a lot is I press the explore button and I find out what's happening in all the hotspots around San Diego. I'm going to tell you about some of my own favorite birding places, but this way you can discover your own favorite birding places as well. And you can also see what unusual birds might be in the area at any one time. Societies to join that will help you with your birding. Well, I love the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have um, all these wonderful resources, um, most of them free, and they have a lovely, um, journal or magazine, um, The Living Bird, that is just chock full of information. I'm also a member of the National Audubon Society. They have also a wonderful, um, very informative magazine. They have a lot of free resources about birds on their web as well. For example, if you want to know about feeding birds, they have a really good, up-to-date, accurate information about that. San Diego Audubon, a local Audubon, is, is a must if you want to get more involved locally and find out what's happening locally with birds. Uh, they also run the San Diego Bird Festival every year, which is a fabulous way to learn more about birding. But also they, they have all these birding trips during the festival. And that's a great way to go with experienced birders and see the areas that are good for birding and learn and see a lot of new species that way. So I mentioned at the beginning that we are a biodiversity hotspot and we have these incredible number of birds. And one of the reason is that we are a sort of key stopping point for the Pacific flyway. Birds are migrating, often they'll go south for the winter and they'll come back up to us to breed or to go further north to breed in the summer. And there are four main flyways, Pacific Flyway, Central Flyway, Mississippi Flyway, and the Atlantic Flyway. And we are, of course, on the Pacific Flyway, which means all the shorebirds, all the waterbirds tend to go up our coast um, or to our different lakes as they go further north. And this is, uh, we also get all the warblers, we get a lot of passerines, a lot of small birds migrating through. And right now we've got lots of um, migrating warblers in our yards. So that adds to why we're so biodiverse. It's also our climate. We have, at least theoretically, a wonderful Mediterranean climate, which um, is very conducive to uh, bird diversity. 
We also have all these diverse habitats in San Diego County, and a lot of these habitats can be found really very close to La Jolla, very close to San Diego. We have beach, obviously, we have salt marshes and lagoons. Now, Southern California has lost a lot of its coastal marshes. And so um, this is very critical habitat and very important for birds that like this kind of habitat. The same with the coastal sage scrub. Development in the coast over many decades has meant there's very little of this left for birds, but there are some wonderful reserves where you can see the birds that love this kind of area. The same with the, the grass and valleys that further inland and then the chaparral, which can, is often mixed with coastal sage scrub. You can see that very well in somewhere like um, Cabrillo National Monument. We have oak woodland, we have the riparian habitat of trees and shrubs beside streams and rivers, and that can be seen as it comes right into San Diego on the San Diego River. Um, and then we also have freshwater marshes, we have mountains, we have meadows, we have vernal pools, which are temporary pools, mixed conifer forest and desert. And so apart from desert, we can see really very close to where we live here, all those buried habitats, which again means all sorts of different birds. So some of my favorite areas to go birding. Well, right here in La Jolla, La Jolla Cove is an area I love to go. I love to take beginning birders there because it's so easy to get very close to pelicans, to cormorants and a lot of shorebirds. And at this time of year, interesting shorebirds are going by. So it's um, a really good place to uh, learn some basic birding. Torrey Pines State Reserve. I love Torrey Pines. I go there a lot. Uh, it's a, a great place to see, um, you can see peregrines. There is a, a nest of peregrines there. But there are also just a lot of birds that like to live in the sage scrub and in the chaparral. So that's a, a, a favorite place of mine. And they're very used to people there. So that's why it's easy to see them. Another place I take beginners is the San Diego River to Rob Field and the, uh, the trail that goes along the south side of the river uh, and the mud flats there. If you want to see water birds, you want to see large birds like ducks and egrets and herons, that is a wonderful place to go. Uh, Formosa Slough, which is very, as, as birds fly, very, very close to Rob Field, is also a wonderful piece of, of wetland to see birds. I tend to go with a friend when I go to Formosa Slough. Uh, San Alijo Lagoon, that's probably my favorite piece of wetland um, just north of Solana Beach. It has everything. It has all this wonderful wetland. It's very well managed. It has great trails. It also goes further inland as well, further east, and so you can see, again, a lot of different birds in different habitats. Cabrillo National Monument that I mentioned earlier is, uh, is a very good place um, for some of our native birds. For migratory birds, also Cabrillo, but particularly um, Fort Rosecrans National Cemetery. Uh, birders are only allowed there before eight in the morning and after five in the evening out of respect. But at this time of year, you will always find birders there looking for that rare bird that's migrating through. Um, further south, at Tijuana Slough, there is a, a national wetland reserve with a nature center and trails. Um, that's a wonderful place to see the rare Ridgeway Rail. And you can also see that at San uh, Elijo. And then for birds that like lakes, like grebes and ducks, Santee Lakes, Lake Hodges, um, great places to bird. So that's just giving you a few ideas of places you might like to go do some birding. The other thing that you probably want to think about before you go birding is learning just a little bit of basic terminology about different parts of birds that you might come across in field guides and for your notes. So this will really help you when you've got that tricky identification. You've got a small little brown bird, what is it? Well, when you look closely, it may not be so nondescript as you think. You want to look at the shape and size of the bill. You want to look at the color of the bill, the color of the eye, the color of the legs. Um, what's the, the color of the crown, the, the head, the nape, the back, the rump, the tail, the tail coverts, or underneath the tail, which is the under tail coverts. 
the thigh, the belly, the side. A lot of this is very um, straightforward to learn, but it's very, very helpful when you're reading your field guide and you think, under tail covers, what does that mean? Where is that and what color were they? So again, this, I think birding really helps the teacher to be highly observant, you have to be observant to look at all these things. So if you look slightly more closely, the other thing that's very helpful in identification is, does, it, does the bird have wing bars or does it have a patch on the wing? And then when you look at the head, does it have a big eye ring like this ruby crowned kinglet at the bottom? Is the bill small and shallow like this little ruby kind kinglet, which is a very delicate bill for eating insects? Or is it a much broader bill like that of the white-throated sparrow, which is designed to crack seeds? And the white-throated sparrow also it has an eyebrow stripe. It has a white crown. It has a, this eye, fine eye line and it has a throat patch. So those are all things that will help you identify what you're seeing. One of my favorite places to bird, especially during this past year has been my own backyard. Now this is not my backyard. This is one of the Cornell Labs feeders at their headquarters in upstate New York. Um, so feeding birds is something that can be a wonderful way to attract birds to your yard and a great way to do bird, uh, birding, even sitting at the kitchen table looking out the window. Um, but you have a responsibility if you're going to feed birds to use the right kind of feeders for the birds you want to attract, but particularly where you position them. So you're positioning them near cover so that they are able to escape, say, that hawk that swoops by and thinks, oh, free lunch. So they need to be able to get away from potential predators and the other thing that's very important is that you need to clean your feeders regularly. There has been an outbreak of salmonella in Southern California in, in some small birds that come to feeders. Um, and it was brought in by a bird called a siskin, which we hardly ever see in this area. But this year they came further south than usual. So our house finches and our gold finches got infected. And as far as I know, it's not around La Jolla, but it certainly was in Oceanside. So, um, I think it's pretty much died out now, but it's, it's an indication of why really you want at least every two weeks to clean your feeders. If you have a platform feeder like I do, which is this bottom feeder here, um, I do clean it out, scrub it thoroughly, and usually put in some vinegar solution for a while um, or let it dry in the sun. So if you look at these feeders, there's a variety here. There's this platform feeder. There are several hanging feeders. In the middle, there's also a feeder with blocks of suet in it to attract woodpeckers because this is in a wood. Um, but there are the peanuts for the jays. There are bigger and smaller nuts for different birds. So you have to think about what birds are in your area, what you want to attract. And then an awful lot of birds won't come to your feeders because they like to eat insects. And so one of the most thing, important things you can do for birds even if you don't want to put up feeders, is to put water out for migratory birds. This time of year, it's wonderful to have a bird bath because they can stop and have a drink. But also if you have any areas where they can rest and hide like bushes and trees in your yard, that's going to attract birds. And of course, probably what's going to attract them most of all, if you have any native trees, plants, bushes, in your yard, that's going to attract insects that like native, native, native plants that they're going to eat. Um, it's also going to be the right kind of nectar that the insects and the birds like. So, because that's what they've evolved with. And if you do that, you're going to have a yard buzzing with birds. So this is one of the most familiar birds. I'm sure a lot of you know, this is a California tohi. This has just come to my platform feeder. Uh, and we think, oh, just another tohi. But you know, folks on the East Coast come all the way to California to see birds like this. So um, next time you see one, realize, that, have, have a really close look and see um, how you can identify it. You look at, the, um, look at the undertail area and you'll see that lovely russet color. You'll look at the, the throat patch, that russet color around the eye, there's some russet. It has a big thick bill for eating seeds. 
Um, so it has, and it's about the size. Size is also very important when you're identifying birds. You want to think, I need a size range. I know what a sparrow looks like. I know what a robin looks like. I know what a pigeon looks like. And then immediately you have a scale. So you want to, a tohi is about the size of a robin. So that gives you um, immediately a scale. We have a lot of wonderful hummingbirds in our area. We have three that come to our yards quite a lot. This is in other areas, a very rare hummingbird. This is an Allen's hummingbird that is common in Southern California, even though its numbers have been declining steadily over the decades, mainly due to loss of habitat. It's very similar to the Rufus hummingbird that is also common in this area. They can be very hard to tell apart, but they do breed earlier, which is one of the reasons I'm particularly sure that not just does this bird have a green back, which you can't see, but it also um, was breeding in December. So this is the female in her very delicate little nest in a hanging vine very close to my front door. And um, it's, it, blow, it used to blow sideways with the wind, very delicate. Um, she raised two little chicks despite the bad weather that December. A bird that many of you will also see in your yards is the Anna's hummingbird. And again, a lot more purple in the male rather than the orange. And it's a bigger bird than the uh, Allen's hummingbird. And there you see the male is displaying. He's got his, his gorget, his neck feathers are really out. He's either trying to ward off a rival or attract a female. And, and bird that's another ground bird that's becoming common in our yards is the junco. Um, and they are, they're now staying a lot longer than tending to stay year round. Um, again, very easy to identify with that black head and throat. And don't forget or overlook the common house finch. The, the males really are beautiful and their song is lovely. Look at that thick bill for eating seeds. So you instantly think that has to be a finch of some kind. Um, and of course, a lot of variation in color. You sometimes get ones with yellow and the females, of course, tend not to have any color at all, though sometimes some females will have some, some red. A, a charming little bird that comes uh, through my yard twice a day, little flocks of them. This is a bush tit. And bush tits are, um, tend to be paler underneath with that brown head and slate gray back and a much more insectivorous, sharp little bill for eating insects. Um, and the um, females have that um, white eye ring inside the eye and, and the males have a, have a darker eye. So you can um, actually sex those birds quite easily. Otherwise they look very similar. So you may see those darting in your yard and um, it's like a gang of them sort of deciding to eat all the insects they can find in one tree and then moving on. Warblers, so um, these are uh, yellow rumped warblers that overwinter with us. And they're charming little birds that you often see in your yard. They have these beautiful patches of bright yellow. It's a yellow crown on this bird. It's the yellow neck patch, the, the yellow side patch, and also the yellow, bright yellow rump, which you can't see on this bird. And it's, it's sharp pointed insectivorous bill for eating all the insects it can find. This is another warbler, um, slightly smaller, delicate little warbler, which is called the orange crowned warbler. They are residents with us, though we do also get a lot of overwintering ones as well. Now you might look at that and think, well, where on earth is the orange crown? You know, and it's not well named. The answer is the orange crown is hiding underneath those crown, those sort of, um, green crown feathers. So this is a, um, a female uh, on the uh, right here. She's feeding a, a fledgling, a very demanding fledgling. And within a few weeks, you may hear a lot of chirping, begging sounds of little birds in your yard. Um, if you're lucky enough to have orange crown warblers. And that's a very easy way to find them. So again, I, I'm not going to go into bird song and bird sounds in depth, but 
learning the bird songs of your, the birds in your area is a very easy way to find them and identify them even without seeing them. Now this is an orange crown warbler who's just had a bath in my um, bird bath. And so there you can see the orange crown that's revealed as the underneath set of feathers. They tend to only show those when they're displaying to females or when they got up, they're upset by say another territorial male, for example. So then you realize, okay, they were, they were named correctly. You can see the orange crown. This is a, another little warbler that's migrating through our yards at the moment. This is the beautiful Wilson's warbler. And the male has that um, black cap at the back, back of his head and um, dark eye. So a very distinctive bird. And the female is the same without the black. And I saw two yesterday in my yard. So I know that this is probably a really good time for you to, to see them. Note that again, that insectivorous bill. And this is just called a yellow throat. It's another warbler that will be migrating through. I have an old fountain in the yard, which is really just a patch of uh, reeds and they love that. So they tend my yard a little bit and they're beautiful warblers. But look at that incredible um, mask, black mask on the face of that, of that bird um, with the white stripe behind it and that beautiful yellow throat. So very aptly named. This is a Townsend warbler. And uh, some of those, these birds overwinter with us. There are also others that we're migrating through at the moment. Um, really very beautiful bird and with very distinctive patterning. And this is a white crowned sparrow. I particularly love these birds because I used to work on them uh, up in the Arctic. And in fact, this bird, which spent most of the winter in my yard is now well on its way to Alaska where it's will breed. So it's, they, they have a, a lovely, rather mournful little song, which always is, to me, evokes um, my days of doing field work. Again, very distinctive. You can see it's a sparrow. Look at that bill. It's, it's not quite as heavy as a finch, but it's, it's, it's not uh, as light as an insectivorous bird. And you look at the very distinct, distinctive white crown um, with the black stripes. Um, so it's, it's a very distinctive bird. This is a lesser goldfinch, just again to you immediately want to look at that bill and you realize, oh, that has to be a finch. It's a big, thick bill, but cracking seeds. Um, and this is a beautiful male in full breeding plumage with, with this lovely, lovely, rich yellow, black head. And this is uh, either a male in winter plumage or a juvenile. And so again, the same markings, but much fainter but it's the same species. So another thing to realize when you're beginning birding is that there is a lot of variation within one species, a variation between male and female, season to season, age. So, and also within one species, there may be several races of the same species. So it's not always going to look exactly like the guidebook. And that's something that's important to to realize um, when you start birding. This is still a lesser goldfinch. This is a female. So again, same species and she's all puffed up. Um, she's a little bit cold, it's early wintry morning. Um, but it, again, it's the same species as the previous two photographs. Most of you I'm sure are familiar with morning doves. You often wake up to the sound of morning doves. Um, and they come to my platform feeder and they eat me out of house and home. And then they sort of collapse is a little, in a little group um, in, in my yard. Not at the moment because they're nesting. This is usually a bit later in the year. And it really pays off to watch the common birds in your yard closely because you never know what else might be there. So one morning I'm sitting on the couch, I'm looking out of the door um, towards the platform feeder and I see a white-winged dove. Now, 
how do I know it's not just a regular morning dove? Because immediately I see that the white edge of the wing. And I see a different eye color. If you look at the color of the morning dove, it's dark. This has got a sort of orange part of its eye. And it's got a longer bill, it's a different build. And so I thought, my goodness, what is that? It has to be a white winged dove, which is a bird that's normally found in the desert. And, but migrating through, there were in fact quite a lot of them seen in San Diego County. It's unusual to see these birds. So living where we do, you never know what birds you might see in your yard, which are not the usual ones. Now a bird that is often seen in our yards as well as in um, other areas like chaparral and sage scrub is the black phoebe. And this is from the flycatcher family. So it's um, insectivorous, but it tends to catch really large insects like this cricket. Um, and it can crunch and swallow those, these insects whole. Uh, I distinctly remember taking this photograph and seeing this, this bird um, have quite a struggle eating such a large piece of prey and looking extremely full afterwards. A very um, familiar bird in our yards, the northern mockingbird. Um, again, instantly identifiable with its bill shape, its, its uh, yellow eye, the, the two white wing bars, um, pale underneath, a long tail, and of course, its beautiful song. I know it can keep us awake at night sometimes, it certainly keeps me awake at night, but um, I do love listening to them during the day, especially as they imitate a lot of other birds around. Um, and they are really a success story. In a time when we are um, seeing a lot of our local birds declining uh, through pollution, through climate change, through habitat destruction, the um, range of the mockingbird is increasing. And that is because in the 19th and early 20th century, they were caught extensively as cage birds and sold so people could listen to them singing in cages. And they are still spreading back up north. They're still recovering from what happened to them. So they, this is a, a nice uh, recovery story. I'm so excited because the Orioles are back. And this is a beautiful hooded oriole. And um, I think it's the same pair because last year he came on the 26th of March and this year he arrived on the 28th of March. And he's just had a, a bit of a bath in this photograph. You can see he's a little bit wet. Um, instantly recognizable, the male with its um, brilliant yellow and its um, really the, the black extending not only on the throat, but back up into the face and through the eye. Uh, and that bill, that bill shape, that long curved bill that can um, not only feed on nectar, but also feeds on insects. The female is not as colorful as the male, but she's very much the same shape, maybe slightly smaller. And here she is, um, she's the one on the left and on the top is this uh, extremely ravenously hungry uh, fledgling uh, that has been out of the nest for maybe a few days and still wants to be fed. Um, and if you have Orioles around your yard, you'll know them. They make this um, very sort of almost rapid firing machine gun call. Um, and the, the youngsters are like very robustious uh, teenagers. They will um, fool around in your yard and, and they're quite fearless. So they're easy to see if they're in your neighborhood. Now this, I put this photograph up because it's, again, it talks about identifying marks and it's hard to, but also just from photographs, it can be hard to identify birds. Um, it's hard to see the bill shape from here. It's hard to see, you think, oh, there may be a large eye ring on this bird, but I'm not sure. Um, but I can see it's got two white wind bars. It's got these yellowy patches on its wing and on the tail. Um, it's got pale um, underside of the tail and uh, pale belly and this white on the throat. So you think, well, is it a warbler? Or what is it? And then you see another photograph. This is the same bird. And you think, oh, different lighting. 
So again, lighting is very crucial because colors show up differently in lighting. Same wing bars, same yellow patch on the wing, but it's now it's suddenly revealed this beautiful red crest and it definitely has a large white eye patch. This is a beautiful ruby crowned kinglet, which is a very small bird um, that often lives in conifer forest, but especially in the winter will often come down into our yards after insects. So it's got a typical little insectivorous bill as well. So it's, it has, it couldn't be anything else but a ruby crown kinglet. So a lot of this depends on how you're seeing the birds, what angle and what lighting they're in, how to recognize them. But ruby crown kinglets are also recognizable when their crest is down. So this is again, an obvious ruby crown kinglet because of that very, very unusually large white eye wing as well as all the other, the wing bars and the yellow patch. I'm gonna talk a little bit now about shorebirds. So this is one of my favorite shorebirds. So I had to put it first. It's got these wonderful um, sort of golden um, legs, beautiful yellow legs. It's got this lovely mottled front um, but its name is Wandering Tattler. And I just think Wandering Tattler is just such a, an unusual and lovely name. And it's got a relatively short bill, but it bobs up and down when it moves around. You can see it on the rocks on the shore. It only migrates through. It's a wanderer. It's not going to stay here. It'll migrate through our area. But I know there are a couple at La Jolla Cove right now that were seen, I think, yesterday or the day before. And the reason I put it there next to this is a spotted sandpiper, because the spotted sandpiper is probably the only other local shorebird you're going to see that bobs its tail up and down. And it has a mottled front, but it has these really only just a few spots, very different from the tight mottling of the um, wandering tattler. Um, and spotted sandpipers are quite common around our area usually on their own, and you can see them on the rocks too. You can immediately tell that this shorebird is from the curlew family because it has this downward curving bill. And if it was a long-billed curlew, the bill would be almost twice as long. This is therefore a wimbrel, which is the other uh, common curlew family bird we have in this area. This is a willet, and, and willets are um, often described as the nondescript shorebird because they don't have, they have some faint markings. You can see a little bit of white under the chin. There's a faint eye stripe, but until they fly, when they have a very broad wing stripe, white wing stripe that you can't see otherwise, they sort of, everything about them is sort of medium, medium sized bill, not, but you know, sort of, not gray legs and, but I think they're rather beautiful because they have a very subtle coloring which I like. And here's a happy willet having uh, caught some, something fun to eat. So um, interesting, a beautiful bird that's around now. I, I think they, they're around La Jolla Cove. Um, I know they've been seen recently in this area is um, the black oyster catcher has this beautiful black head and this lovely chocolate brown body and a brilliant red bill. This photograph was taken in winter and the bill is not so intensely red. And right at the moment, it looks like somebody's painted their bills with bright red paint. This is um, a black neck stilt. It has um, these incredibly long pink legs. And so hence the name stilt. And it has this long, delicate, slightly upturned bill. And you can see these um, San Alijo Lagoon, you can usually see one or two. And you can also usually see them at Formosa Slough as well. This is a plover. This is actually called a killdeer, but it's from the plover family. And it has this red eye, which is a, a really short little bill for a shorebird. And it's got two black bands. So that's a very strong, and then the two black stripes on the head. So really strong identifying marks. This is another plover. This is the semi-palmated plover. It just has the one broad band. 
Um, so very different from the killdeer. And so this is just to show you sort of size differences. Now this wimble is a little bit closer to me than the um, spotted sandpiper. This photo was taken in winter, so the spotted sandpiper has no spots. It only has spots during the breeding season. But you can see it's a much smaller bird. So again, really size is so important when you're birding and it's such a help. We have some wonderful egrets and herons in our area. And this is easily and immediately identified as a snowy egret. And the reason is it has these wonderful yellow feet and it has this dark bill. And this one has caught something delicious to eat. I can't identify exactly what the fish is, but um, it's, they're quite often not just marshes, but they will go to tide pools as well. Now this bill, this bird notice has a completely different colored bill. This has a yellow bill and it's much bigger. Now, again, it, unless you have comparisons, it can be hard to tell differences in size. It also has completely black legs and black feet. This is a, um, a great egret. This is a reddish egret, and you can see as its head and, and neck is caught in brilliant sunlight, that why it's called the reddish egret. This is a, a visitor, a relatively rare visitor, but often around the Rob Field area, these, uh, there's one there at the moment, um, and they have this really interesting way of fishing. They, they put their, their wings up to create shade. And not only does that help them to see through the water better, it also attracts the fish to the shade. So it's a, it's a clever way of fishing. Uh, this is a juvenile um, black crown night heron. And um, again, it's just showing how juveniles, the, the adults are black and white, and you have this uh, extremely different colored juvenile bird that and it's very difficult to distinguish between these juveniles and the juveniles of the yellow crowned night heron. And uh, you can see yellow crowned night heron sometimes at Rob Field, uh, but also um, you see them at, at Tijuana Slough as well. We have a lot of gull species and we have a lot of beautiful terns. This is a uh, lovely Caspian tern, big thick red bill, black cap that extends all the way um, from the tip of the bill to the back of the head. We have the small little delicate um, little terns, uh, least terns that are um, quite rare and can be found um, nesting in certain parts of our county on the coast. But there are species that is, uh, has been declining. And we also get a lot of terns migrating through. These are um, uh, royal terns that were actually, I took this photo on at La Jolla Shores. Um, you get elegant terns and royal terns at this time of year. And I just, I love terns. I think they're, they're very delicate, interesting, beautiful birds. And watching their antics when they're um, fishing is just extraordinary. I don't have a photograph of a, a pelican um, to show you, I realize, I, but you all know what pelicans look like. I think you probably all know what cormorants look like. We have two common species in this area. We have the brants that has a lot of, is a dark head with blue under, uh, underneath the throat when it's breeding. And we have the double-breasted cormorant, and I never see the double breasts, but it is a breasted, uh, crested cormorant. Um, it has this yellow on the face, which is very distinctive. One of the rarest birds uh, in the county is Ridgeway's rail. I think I mentioned it earlier. You can see Ridgeway's rail at San Alijo Lagoon and also the places like Tijuana Slough, um, anywhere where there is a sort of tidal wetlands. Um, it's making a comeback. It's been reintroduced into some places and it's, it's a fascinating and beautiful bird to see. So I, I recommend going to San Alijo Lagoon because they're pretty tame. They're pretty used to people there. 
and at high tide, they tend to come to the edge of the water. Our freshwater lakes, um, I think I mentioned Santee Lakes and Lake Hodges is particularly good to see grebes. We get Western and Clark's grebes. This is a Clark's grebe um, displaying and nesting there. Uh, it's an amazing sight to see part of their, their courtship display as they rush across the water. Um, they look as if they're walking on the water. It's quite extraordinary. Um, um, so these are American widgeon, which again, I, there are a lot of different species of waterfowl that you're going to see um, both on the coast and, and inland lakes as well. I won't go into many of them, but this is a beautiful little um, duck that you often see in the winter here, the bufflehead. Um, and it's not quite as common as say the widgeon that are really seen in a lot of places. Or you may see these beautiful cinnamon teal. And there are lots of other species of waterfowl and it's a whole specialty into itself. And um, I love ducks always. I think they're beautiful birds. Kingfishers, if you're going to waterways, you'll probably see the Belgic kingfisher. Birds of prey, I think it's important to mention birds of prey and, and how distinctive they are. Um, so this is uh, an osprey and it, you can immediately tell it's a bird of prey because it's got the, that big hooked bill. It's got these huge talons. And so birds of prey are, are very distinctive. We have a lot. We, um, this is a red-shouldered hawk. And now these are being seen more around our yards. Um, again, it's got the hooked bill, it's got big talons. This is a, um, a red-tailed hawk. I think it's a juvenile. It's the same, you can see the, the, the big bill. And of course, owls are predators as well. And for several weeks recently, there was a little burrowing owl like this one, very close to the trail in San Alija Lagoon. They often turn up around Rob Field as well and further south. Um, so they're one of my very favorite birds. They're just, they're so relaxed around people um, and they are, beautiful with that lovely, lovely eye and just, you know, that very owl-like features. I, I just think they're beautiful little birds. And we have a lot of other interesting little rare birds. This is a gnat catcher. This is, um, in fact, a, a gray-blue or blue-gray gnat catcher that is a slightly different species, um, very subtle differences from the even rarer California gnat catcher, which actually breeds in some of our reserves. So we're sort of going inland a little bit. Um, the Buick's wren, very common in sage scrub and chaparral, um, but also in some of our yards. Uh, again, it's getting slightly more towards getting a little more inland. Um, the California thrasher, which has that very distinctive curved bill. Uh, and then of course the California quail. The spotted towhee, very, very um, similar shape to the California towhee that we started off with, but of course has the, this brilliant black head with the incredible um, red eye and the, the russet, the light the, and the spotted back. So again, very similar size and shape to the California towhee, but with this beautiful coloring. And so that was the end of my slideshow and apologize for the interruption. And if we have any more questions. Um, I have a question from Mary Mitchell. She says, do any or all of the apps you mentioned have a good bird call identification? The ones that I've used frequently, yes, they do is the answer. Um, they, have, they have very, uh, good calls. One of the things I really talk to people about is it, it's very tempting to use those calls to attract birds. Um, and I don't do that because it disrupts the bird behavior and that can, can damage that bird, especially if it's tired, if it's migrating. Um, but I do very much just quietly listen to those sounds. I think, oh, am I listening? Is that an orange crown warbler? So I'll look it up on Merlin and it'll be, it'll give me the, um, a few very short playbacks of songs from different birds. 
and I'll think, oh yes, that, that's my bird. So really, that's a good question. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so I have a question from Lee. If you could only pick one local location to go bird watching, which would it be? Uh, San Lee Hill Lagoon. Um, I also have a question from Mona here that says, uh, what is the best time to go to the San Alejo Lagoon? Well, it's always, do you mean time of year or time of day? I'll answer both. So um, as early in the morning as possible is always a good time to go birding, which for somebody like me, who's not a naturally early riser, this is always a struggle. Um, and the, any time of year is a good time to go to somewhere like that because it's always different. So you're going to have the spring and fall migration, you're going to have the wintering birds and you're going to have the breeding birds. So somewhere like that, it's always a good time to go. So I have a question from Catherine. She says, well, yeah, a question. It says, I have birds that are fascinated by some exterior bronze mirrors. They dance up against the mirrors multiple times a day. They are not crashing, they are dancing. Do you know why that could be? Yes, um, I don't know which species she's seeing, but birds typically often do, um, do threat displays um, because they're seeing themselves in the mirror and they assume it's a rival. So males are thinking, what is that male doing in my territory? Go away! And so it flaps its wings or makes a display and some birds will actually peck at, at the mirror or the window. Um, so it's not displaying as if it's a female, very unusual for that to happen. It's, it's much more likely that it's trying to get a bird that it thinks is an, is an intruder to go away. So that's a fairly classic um, thing that tends to happen. I would love to know which species this bird actually is. Thank you. Maybe, um, maybe Catherine knows and she could enter it in the chat. Um, Let's see, I have a question from Jane that says, are there any native parrots or were they all released from captivity? Sadly, we don't have any native parrots, though I'm really pleased that we've got some feral flocks of parrots. So um, I don't think it's completely known how they came to build up here, but they certainly didn't fly in from Mexico, for example. They almost certainly got released either um, on purpose or by accident um, in various different ways. There have been stories that I read, like a whole lot, you know, a, the whole pet store, you know, they all escaped. And um, so it's, it's difficult to know exactly, but it, it certainly was probably some kind of escape from captivity. All right. Um, I have a question from Mona that says, do you lead birding tours in San Diego? I don't know. I don't consider myself nearly good enough to do that, but I'm very happy to, um, if anyone wants to contact me, to put them in touch with really wonderful people who do. Um, a question from Michelle. What are the best plants or feeders to put in your yard? We have hummingbird nests uh, in our yard. We have a hummingbird nest in our yard. You so you want to attract more hummingbirds, perhaps. So you want, definitely want to put up a hummingbird feeder. Um, and you, it's very simple to really fill it with sugar water solution. You just want to, you have um, one part sugar to three parts water. Um, so that's a, a very, if you have hummingbirds, that's a must. Um, again, it depends, the feeders you want to have, you want to attract other things. Um, if you want to attract ground feeding birds, you want a platform feeder. So if you want doves and um, juncos and towhees and finches, the platform feeders work really well. If you want a hanging feeder, um, if you fill it with something like thistle seed, the Niger seed it's called, um, then you will attract things like goldfinches. So again, it's very, it's very much what you want to attract. You can also have a hanging feeder with just a good quality of mixed feed. Um, and again, you, you want um, something that probably has a lot of um, sunflower seeds in it and that's the black um, oil sunflower seeds, not the, the ones that we tend to crack and eat because those are, have such thick shells that it's hard for the birds to break them open. But the black sunflower seeds are so uh, really, um, it's the seed we get sunflower oil from, but you can buy bags of it um, to feed birds with. Thank you. 
Um, I have a question from Linda that says, we saw the burrowing owl at San Alejo for several weeks, but then it was gone. Do they migrate? Um, I believe they move locally. I don't think they migrate long distances at all. All right. Um, and I have, Catherine said she doesn't know the name of the dancing bird, but she will work on identifying it. Thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Hilgarth. It was fascinating. I loved seeing all the different types of birds here in San Diego. Um, and thank you everybody else for joining us today. Again, um, please don't forget to check out what we have coming up at the La Jolla Community Center at ljcommunitycenter.org. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you again, Dr. Hilgard. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you so much.